you're with us again, tuning back into Human Genome Architecture, broadcasting live from half around the world, from nearby Munich, where I am, and where you, the Soto, are in Honolulu, Hawaii. Yes, hello, everybody. Good, good. And we're doing another potential post-pandemic production uh, show here today, and we're going to do a volume three of comparing the two major economical forces on the islands, which is hospitality and military. That's right. And so uh, let's go to the first slide and, if you don't mind, recap quickly what we've been doing last time. We have talked about um, the basic situation of, in a pandemic world, with the shutdown of tourism in its entirety here in Honolulu and on the rest of the Hawaiian Islands, what else can we turn to economically? And the other major force here economically, of course, is the military and military spending. So we talked about two of the buildings that you and your family's uh, architectural firm built in Germany for military there. And we also talked about, it, we, in the two pictures at the very top, one of the things that the military is good at doing is doing things quickly and moving things around and installing infrastructure and being able to do that. And we looked at, on the other side of the top picture, uh, the need for low-income housing, particularly at this time in economic stress. And one of the things that you have come up with, and you're not the only one, is the use of shipping containers for housing, for people who do not have housing. And could the military participate in this in some manner, being able to move things around, physically big things, and put them in place, install infrastructure, et cetera. So, that's where we left on our last time. That's right. Yeah, and, and we were saying, um, yeah, and we were saying maybe it could be have a direct impact because we're saying everything is changing. So if we're not, if the pandemic stays around and we can't travel anymore and move, you know, uh, the oil, you know, is going to be increasingly useless, and that's what we've been fighting over and about the United States with you know, many wars in the world, and if we don't need that anymore, maybe we can sort of redefer uh, the the funding. And uh, quoting our dear friend Ron Lindgren, who's going to be with us in the next pre-show, says, you know, fighting the good fight. And that's, right. you know, using, using that for the military. Or, as you said, uh, in a more indirect way, in sort of applying the means and methods that the military is using, which is different than architecture has become in this whole Zars, this very romantic, sentimental way, which sometimes is in our way, towards a more engineering way, a more dry cut way, but yet very efficient and efficient and effective way. Right? Exactly. So that's, that's the idea. Right, because exactly. the CCCs, after all, they are line, lined up in a row to create that effect, the all-American effect of buy one, get one free, creating the courtyard. So they are very sort of and in order and marching right next to each other, but yes, I do this for a humanitarian mission. As you exactly, put it, right? and, th and that, and, and as you said, that is looking ahead to the post-pandemic world, and that's what we are. Yeah, that, that's what that are. That's our aim here. But before we that, get to that, we can go to the next slide and we can talk about the history of the military here in the Hawaiian Islands, and to give a really short recap of that, and this photograph from the 1930s of the soldier standing with Diamond Head in the background is a juxtaposition of those two images of the romantic view of Hawaii and Waikiki as a tourist destination with the reality of the military, and the military is a huge presence here in Hawaii, particularly on the island of Hawaii, on the island of Oahu, mm -hmm. I should say, and we'll see evidence of that in a short time from now. But just to recap very briefly, as soon as, um, I'm going to go back to the 1870s, that's when the United States military first got control of Pearl Harbor, because Pearl Harbor was the biggest harbor in the Pacific, and it was considered necessary for control of the Pacific, and in the early 1900s, after annexation was finalized in 1900, the U.S. Army then built a series of four bases along the south shore of Oahu, and those were intended to defend the island from off an offshore enemy who would be attacking using battleships with huge guns. 
So these four military bases would have used huge guns in return, and that enabled the, the U.S. Army to purchase and or in some cases condemn big pieces of property or big tracts of property. Um, and we're going to look at two of those, but one of them is um, in around and in Diamond Head that we see in the distance in this picture, and that is Fort Ruger. And it's all been, most of that's been turned back over to the state government, but we do have another yeah. very important one that we're going to be talking about in just a yeah. second. And, to, and today that's very little apparent intentionally because the tourist industry is going to hide the traces yeah. for their own benefit. Yes, exactly. But let's go to the next slide. That was way different way back. That's this picture most perfectly talks about the two forces that exactly. Were drive us. Right? Exactly. So here's an aerial photograph of Waikiki in the 1930s. And in the foreground at the bottom, you can see there were only two large hotels there at the time, even though that was the center of tourism. We only had the Royal Hawaiian Hotel and the Moana Hotel. But in the air, flying over Diamond Head, is a formation of military airplanes from the what was then called the Army Air Corps. And this is from the 30s, again, showing the military buildup that was happening at the time before World War II started. But the juxtaposition, again, shows us very clearly the past and the future, which we're going to be talking about, and the present of yeah. how the military and tourism may come together or have come together in some situations. Exactly. And, and this picture, I suppose, I should say a thank you, although I, I believe the, the, the sort of the copyright is from you guys from the Bishop Museum, but you gave it free for being sold commercially, and that was given to me by my dear Stefan, my dear friend Stefan, who we know as a German tiki uh, basement uh, expert. <laughs> and so thank you, Stefan, because he gave that to me in one of the years when he was staying with me. So here is your picture. <laughs> So, uh, go to the next good. slide again. Next slide, once again, from, from your archives. Yeah. And we have featured that once before in a show, but we want to re-feature that because it's so amazing that yeah. this is in Kapiolani Park that no one would ever imagine these kind of shattered vehicles, you know, being all over the place. Exactly. Well, this is from World War II. And then when World War II finally came here, which had been prepared for for years by the military, it came unexpectedly, or at least it was unexpected based on how the Army and Navy had been seeing things up until that point, because technology changed so quickly in the early 1900s, between 1900 and 1941, that the expected war was not fought with battleships offshore the way the Army and the Navy had prepared. It was fought by airplanes, and so that's what happened when Japan attacked on December 7, 1941. And... When that happened, it was realized that if Japan returned and actually tried to occupy the Hawaiian Islands, you needed to prepare for potential airplane or glider landings. And so to make it impossible for aircraft to land on large open spaces like the Pilani Park or golf courses, they put these wrecked cars in the way. So right at the base of Romantic Diamond Head, the war intrudes with wrecked cars placed in Kapilani Park so it couldn't be used as an emergency airfield. Well, all those cars yeah. are gone, but if you look in the upper right corner, you see that we do still have vestiges of World War II today mm -hmm. in the form of some other types of structures, like Quonset huts. That's a picture of a Quonset hut. Yeah, but it gets even more weird and extreme, which gets us to the next slide, because these are our famous well be known beaches. Look at how right. scenic they were back then. Exactly, because wire. during World War II, again, in, in the fear of a potential Japanese landing, barbed wire was put along as much of the coastline around the Hawaiian Islands as possible, and that included Waikiki. Mm -hmm. So here is Waikiki Beach in 1943, lined with barbed wire, but they did leave holes for people to go to and from mm -hmm. the sand, so you can see people are out on the beach enjoying themselves, but with barbed wire in the foreground. And this is something which is somewhat comparable to the situation we find ourselves in today. Tourism was shut down 100% during World War II, but the economic backlog or the economic 
bolstering was the amount of military spending that occurred instead. So economically, everything kept going. We're in the situation today of complete shutdown of tourism, when it is far more important part of our, our uh, economy. We don't have anything to fill that space. We don't have military spending to take the, the place of that money. So this, in a way, is very similar to what we are dealing with right now during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's go to the next slide, which reminds us of how we were used to see our very sort of, you know, vibrant tourist metropolis of Waikiki. Um, we had announced in the last show that we're going to get support because what do we know about tourism? We know someone who knows, and that's our exotic escapism expert, Susanna who uh, we're all suffering from corona in one way or another, and she's a victim to a degree that she, as a, for most of the year, a single mom, um, is, has to stay home and do homeschooling, but not the way she was used to do that when she was living in America, where she was actually in charge. But now that kind of the DOE equivalent people here in Germany tell her what she has to teach the kids, and that's rather nerve-wracking, as you can tell. So... Uh, here she is, and on the top right is her qualification, which is her degree in business and tourism. And she also has experience from the 20 years ago when she was on the island, uh, more personally with the military. And um, from and, and to that regard, at the very bottom, this shows us very clearly in color code. It's a red is the quantitative uh, chunks of military that you said is, is very much dominating our island, and you can see the proportions of that. It's, it's pretty apparent, but it's not so apparent anymore for the, 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 the tourist driving because, as you said, and, and you told me that in the past, uh, military people had to wear their uniform, so they were very clearly identifiable. That's not the case anymore, and the, again, being majorly driven by the tourist industry. The tourist industry has little to no interest to um, basically celebrate the uh, the coexistence uh, in, in such a domination of the military on the island, right? You still there? You still there? No? You still there? I sort of have a hard time hearing DeSoto, um, hoping that I'm still on air. Let's go to the next slide, and hopefully we can get DeSoto back uh, in a minute. So I see Eric kind of before the slide, so I'm still on air. So um, there were some recent events that, you know, Suzanne was saying, there's some indications of, of uh, paradise and pearl. This looks like there's war. But in fact, it's not. Well, it was more on a more personal basis than a weird guy was um, setting historic houses on fire in the sodas in my neighborhood here. So some signs of riot and and sort of the, the balance of um, of paradise a little bit shaken. And we go to the next slide, please. And I'm just hearing here getting texted that the soda is uh, still uh, on the. Uh, you can still hear him, but I can't hear him. So that is now challenging for us to do a show together where we can't hear each other. So um, whenever I see your face, DeSoto, I will shut up and you take over, okay? Does that work? I think that's the best we can improvise from now. <laughs> so um, here's another sign um, uh, of um, things not being so peaceful anymore. The surfboards that visiting Will Bruder at the top left had uh, been thrilled about and had been set on fire by another weirdo, and they luckily didn't uh, burn the wing of the Moana surf rider down. Um, but um, uh, again, everything else is gone. And, and there, so this is an indication. I put Kurt Sandburn in here, our most activist journalist um, on the island. Um, then, um, I guess, uh, he was presenting a, another disaster, which would have been of economical impact, um, because that wing was um, supposedly been taken down uh, and replaced with a high-rise. And so um, that obviously didn't happen, and we're uh, not unhappy about that, uh, to say the least. Um, go to the next slide. 
Um, this is, again, the sort of where techn technical difficulties, I hear it's still there, but you can't hear me, but I just keep on going. And uh, this is taken by the Soto some days ago and taking his right of the press uh, being an essential business. And this is him in the Porco chair of the Moana Surf Rider, where, again, no people are there anymore, but the building in the background is as important. And while we feel for everyone, you know, of the many who are infected by the virus, that there's always a good thing potentially about everything bad, uh, here in that case, uh, we were hoping that uh, the plan to tear the uh, Princess Kailani Hotel in the background down will be put on hold or will never happen because we have done a show about it and we're referencing to that at the top right that this is a very mid-century modern marvel that we think if you just wait that a little longer, um, uh, from what they are thinking, obviously being outdated, and if you wait a little longer, it becomes it transitions to the vintage stage, and that's what we're predicting. So we're hoping again. And we know the virus gives us also the chance to sit down and reflect more on things than we have done it in the in the past. So uh, we're hoping uh, that will happen, and uh, owners will watch the show and will reconsider and sort of just touch up uh, lightly their piece and and, uh, you know, um, um, celebrate it as the uh, mid-century modern model it is. Uh, next slide. Okay, good we have you back, to Soto. Yes, so, I'm here. Uh, this picture, again, from your, from your treasure box, your archives, and uh, this must be, once again, our my front yard and your front yard, Kapsalani Park, because that's the only point where you can see Diamond Head with, without obstruction of uh, buildings and high rises. So this is our park. No, my goodness, no, Martin. You are incorrect. This is Fort Derussi, and you can tell that this is military by all of those men that are marching there. This is one of the four, mm -hmm. uh, the four forts that the army built across the south shore of Oahu, as I've said, as I mentioned earlier, starting in 1906. And this is the large open space of Fort Derussi. Now, Fort Derussi was built to be a fort, a military fort, and we still have a vestige of that today in the bunker that was built to hold the giant guns, which they tried to demolish in the late 1960s, and it was such thick concrete that they had to give up and give up and leave it there because it was impossible to move. But what we have seen is, even though the Army still owns Fort Derussi, it's shifted away from its defensive use to become what it now is. And we've got a picture of that, if we want to go to the next slide. Here's an aerial photograph of Fort Derussi as it looks today with a big beach in the front of it, beautiful beach. But right in the middle of Waikiki, that military land is still there. It is, however, as I said, just used for recreation, and it contains a modern resort hotel. that's run by the Army for members of the military, whether they are current military members or retired military. And so this is the two, those two forces coming together that we've been talking about, the military in Hawaii and tourism in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. They happen to actually yeah. both exist together there. Yeah, and I shared with you that I was one uh, based upon uh, David, my professor, Rockwood, uh, Tropic here, Rockwood colleague was invited by, because he's from Oregon, uh, from Portland, um, and so the uh, Portland State University, a faculty member there, had, supposedly had strong ties to the military, and so he invited him and me to be part of a workshop. So we were eyewitnessing, and the topic was how can you make you know the land more useful and certainly put more buildings on it, more densified, so we know firsthand the military is not sleeping. They're thinking about it, and you've been telling me that over the years, there were always discussions about if the military should and could afford it, if they should give it to the city. But we were saying then that would probably be given to private developers, and then it wouldn't be that green lung anymore, right? It exactly. would like, look like everything else in YTC. Right, and the irony is that because the military took it over, we have this huge open space still in existence in Waikiki, which otherwise would have been paved over a long time ago. And you can see in this picture very exactly. very clearly, there's the open space around the Halekoa Hotel. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So go to the next slide. Um, 
which is, again, uh, something we have been featuring, at least in part, in a show, which we're referencing to at the top rise, where we're talking about the best lanai on the island. And this is, this is an addition of another wing that was uh, uh, completed a couple of years later, and, that, and it speaks for that the military, um, you know, is able to produce, you know, qualitative work. I mean, this is a good piece of, as we like to call it, tropical modernism, right? Oh, sorry, tropical brutalism. Brutalism. Yes. Modern, too, but more yeah. specific, tropical brutalism. And it's a nice piece, a very sexy piece, and these curvy, cast in place, uh, bell of Yeah. So, again, the, the military, you know, it has proven to be a good partner. Uh, certainly nationally anyways, I remember from moving from the prairie to the desert, I was going through uh, uh, Colorado and, and saw um, the Air Force Academy there with uh, yeah. the, the marvelous chapel, you know, yes. the Artemisian pavilion, so on a national level anyway. But even here on a local level, we have this proof of evidence that the military might be a good partner to yep. talk about what we're interested in, building culture after right. all. Right, exactly, exactly. Go to the next slide. This is the condition that you were talking about. You took this picture here. You yeah. had the lock, the lockout and the lockdown, and the, the beach is deserted. It's a surreal situation. Again, here's the memory of Suzanne way back hanging out with some um, uh, military people there. So um, again, uh, we were thinking, the three of us were thinking, okay, how should we proceed from here and go to the next slide? Um, that is something we were brainstorming. This is a collage of many things we were um, uh, talking about last night. We were rehearsing. And uh, one of the things is that the governor, based upon, I guess, the uh, consultants of the tourist industry, was saying this very kind of sketchy thing that we should brand ourselves as the safest place on earth. And what is your response to that? Well, unfortunately, if you say you're the safest place on Earth to attract lots of people, once those people start coming, it's not necessarily going to be the safest place on Earth anymore because we have the option of reintroducing the pandemic, which we have worked yeah, so yeah. hard to get rid of. Uh-huh. That's so true. And the other thing we want to quote is uh, a recent uh, guest on our previous show, Urban Transcendence, who is Professor Ulf Meyer, and Ulf just uh, published an article that um, doesn't is lacking the, the English translation, so it's going to be your, in this case, pretty lengthy uh, German, <laughs> uh, weekly German lesson that I might want to spare you on. But he makes some really good bullet points here about, not actually about how tourism primarily, this article is about, is a review of a book that looks into, uh, looks into housing, but he was sort of sidetracking that to tourism and saying that the trend in dwelling these days in the, in the next generation is going to be different anyways because they don't want to make a home their lifetime project with mortgage and all this stuff. They want to have a more nomadic lifestyle. And, and all these things he kind of touches upon there. And they reminded us of our studies in, uh, in new buildings for the island, which in particular are the Primitiva. Yes. And, and, and it made us actually be critical about Primitiva 1, which was still fostering the more compartmentalized, lives of paradise, little units, that is very multifunctional. But again, given the situation and the, the kind of the pressure of home office, can you imagine if you have a, a, a couple of family members and you're all going to share that very small space? And, and that is happening, right? And, it and sure is. Families, for example, of lower income, they have to live through situations like that, it's going to be a, a hardship. So how can you home office your kids? Uh, how can you homeschool your kids? How can you home office yourself? Everything on a small. So that brought us, maybe, uh, you know, made us think more about the Primitiva too. Uh, and you want to dwell upon that a little bit? Why that well, might be the, more attractive under the given circumstances? Well, one of the things that this the, it, it's in the German text is the word cocooning. And what we see oh, yeah. is in the open spaces that, that we see in the, in the picture on the left, you can have smaller areas that are specific for specific tasks. And so on one hand, yeah. 
we have this we face the the um, option of creating smaller spaces but on the other hand we also realize that we have to social distance and you've also got a picture of social distancing um, you've got a very clear uh, diagram of don't get close together in this German in this German sign that you took a picture of. In other words, don't cluster together, mm -hmm. but you've got to space yourself yeah. out, and that's something you can do there as well. Yeah, and if you're looking for giving yourself a USP, I think we learned from Suzanne again, the unique selling proposition, is in a little bit more humble, but maybe even more explicit way is, yes, we have climatically the best conditions uh, to live through a situation because right. we got the cleanest air, we got the coolest air compared to, let's say, our Trumpian tropics of Florida, right? Wow. Yeah. How do you want to live easy breezy? How do you want to, you, you got to somehow protect yourself. And so that is why AC is so predominant there. We don't necessarily, so we can live outdoors while being sheltered from the rain and the sun at the same time. Right. And then, as you said, we can cocoon ourselves in this wide open, in this case, cascading down landscape. So this might actually be a really good prototype for, you know, obviously prices of many kinds, but also this one here. Right. Um, let's go to the next and final slide here. Um, which is basically uh, in a couple of hours, a uh, few hours ahead, uh, the emerging generation will further dwell upon that. Uh, the studio I'm teaching about the subject matter at the beginning, not knowing how even more current it would become, uh, all the physical models we've been doing while we're still able to meet in person at the university, the School of Architecture, and the picture at the top right is obviously when we had shifted to uh, online and also then um, us being half around the world, which actually has turned out to be quite um, actually um, 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 successful, positive, I would say, because it has, it, it's successful, we will have to see, but I hope so. But for sure, opening our eyes uh, even more for all these potential scenarios. And we're not able, probably even after tomorrow, we won't be able to give explicit answers, but I think we'll have plenty more very valuable questions to ask, which will then lead to answers. Exactly, so, and that is the whole point of what we're talking about. We are in a pandemic right now. What are we going to do in the future when it dies down or when it's under control? How is that going to affect mm -hmm. our lives? And we cannot say right now what the long-term effects are going to be, but they might be significant and unforeseen. And that's what we're going to be looking at in the next year and further. How do we deal yeah. with a new world? Obviously, yeah, and obviously in many more shows, but we will take a little break, a little bit of catching a breath, I guess, and yes. many uh, places are doing by opening up more carefully, hopefully, and we will open up a little bit more and revisit our friends on Lindgren and do a series of three shows about how the resort architecture yeah. of the term Killingsworth and Partners and also Congat Hilton had started on yeah. our island. And we'd yeah. to see you again for that. And until then, stay safe and sound. Bye, everybody.